uh, our next speaker here is Alex Ellis, and he will talk to us about VMs versus containers versus Firecracker. That's right. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you very much. Very kind. Um, we just saw a talk, if you were in the room, about using Delve. And the first thing that the guy did was run a privileged container. So I don't know if anyone else in the room here has done anything naughty like that, a little bit like, I hope, yeah, I wouldn't do this in production. Um, and, and this is why I brought this talk. So Firecracker is a new approach to doing VMs. It doesn't have a lot of disadvantages because it was built in a cloud-native world. And things like privileged containers, you don't necessarily need them. And for those kinds of use cases where you're, I'm not sure if I should be doing this in production, this might be the tool for you. So we're going to weigh in. And I know for a lot of you here, I'll be sort of preaching to the choir when I tell you about containers. But let me do that just to, to set the context. Um, we'll see the pros and cons. We'll also look at the users that I know of Firecracker, so people that, that I know from the community, people that I've spoken to um, and that I'm aware of, but there are other use cases too. Now, the reason why I know all of this about Firecracker is because I've been building a product um, that does CI, and containers just weren't good enough. And I'll explain why we needed VMs instead. Um, and then we'll look at how do you actually use it, and when should you use it, because this is how you might go off and equip yourselves, do a bit of experimentation, what do you actually need? So getting straight into it. I worked at a payroll company called ADP. Some of you in, from the US here are still paid by ADP um, on your payroll. And we had these very large VMs. They were Windows VMs. They were about 20 gigs compressed, 60 gigs uh, uncompressed, and the idea was that Every week, the, the engineering team would build this. You would download it. It would have the latest platform on it, right? Um, and this all took far too long. And no, nobody was ever on the right version. Nobody knew what was going on. Um, but we were able to run it in a traditional hypervisor. And that meant Windows. And everything just worked. Mac OS, Linux, Platform 9, you know, no limits, really. But they're very slow to start up. You're talking a few minutes to boot it. The images were huge. And also, it was emulating a lot of stuff you probably didn't need just for hacking on a .NET application, like a CD-ROM drive, floppy disk. But they're really easy to use. Anything works with them, and you get an isolation level. right? When it comes to um, containers, really, we should probably call them formerly known as Docker, because they really did everything to bring them to this industry. Um, and we're really probably talking about Linux containers here rather than you know, um, Windows containers. The real proposition was that at ADP, I used to have to go and ask, I'd be on a call, it'd be five, six o'clock in the evening by the time the Americans had deployed production. I wanted to go home, but instead, I was asking them to email me a DLL so that I could open it and see if my change was there. So when I heard about Docker in 2015, I was really excited because it would solve that problem for me. I knew that what was built on my machine or in CI was guaranteed to be in production. Right? And that, that's why this was so important for the industry. And then it did give us a level of sandboxing. But as we know, it only takes one container vulnerability, and there's a lot of those for that to all come undone. Right? Maybe that's not a problem if you're, if you're running your own software within your own small team, running your own product in production. But for multi-tenancy, it's a bit trickier. You just don't have the level of isolation because we're using one host kernel. That's great, because we're just a lot faster, right? You can even find software like Postgres prepackaged by Bitnami or Docker themselves, download it, run it, you're up and running in no time. Containers are also great because of the reuse, right? So you may find that one layer that has all of the Ubuntu code is already in your remote registry, and you just added Redis, and you just end up pushing 20 megs instead of two gigabytes. With traditional VMs, you have to push the whole thing. We have almost an instant boot, because it's not really booting a system. It's just running a program. And the last thing that probably we don't talk about much is copy and write. And this is what allows us to take uh, one image and spin it up 100 times without using any disk space because only the things that we change. 
right? Now, you might think, Alex, you know, we know all this. We're at KubeCon, but there's a reason I'm recapping this, and you'll see that soon, all right? Okay, entry point. That's the program we're going to run. In a container, we don't need system D. In fact, you can't really even run it properly without privileges. You then have your root file system layers, copy and write, and chroot in the Linux kernel is quite interesting. It just sort of pins you at a directory and doesn't allow you to go any, any higher. Um, we get a process namespace around this, and then cgroup limits would allow us to, to limit RAM and CPU consumption. And then we need some kind of ethernet bridge. So this is really what we're thinking about as a container. Now, AWS has a different view on multi-tenancy to perhaps people that have adopted Kubernetes. They're not really comfortable with taking one host kernel and putting two customers' code into it. Um, in fact, what they used to do was give each customer an EC2 instance and try and deploy all of their Lambda functions within it. And then if they needed to scale, they'd have to boot up a whole one, reserve all of that VM for that customer. And then when they had relinquished control, they would wipe it with a script. You know, kind of hacky, and they didn't like it. So they adapted uh, something called a virtual machine monitor, or a VMM, that would allow them to start really teeny tiny VMs that didn't have all of those downsides of the traditional hypervisor. And then we get these guest kernels back, and that's what makes us feel more secure than running in a container where we're one vulnerability away from you know, a, a very bad incident. So how is a Firecracker different from a traditional VM? Well, this project's at 1.0 now. It's actually a few years since it's been released, so you may know some of this. It is an instant start, almost like the container, even though it does start a kernel. If you install system D, you can probably boot up in maybe 500, 600 milliseconds. If you go directly to your own process, you write your own init, maybe 100 milliseconds. This is quite quick. It's API-driven, whereas something like VirtualBox and ESXi are not strictly API-driven. They're very legacy. They need tools like VRO, VRA, these very expensive product suites. Um, but here you have a HTTP API. And then rather than having a CD drive um, and a floppy disk, you only have virtual network, virtual disks, a keyboard that can only press the reboot key, um, and a serial console. Now, this might sound great. It is great because it's really limited, but actually a lot of people want to do things like GPU processing with the, all the interest in AI, and you can't because it doesn't have a PCM, PCI uh, bus available. Right? Finally, you can run it like a container, and I'll kind of explain what I mean by that. But like the container we had, host kernel, separate guest kernel, operating system, user land, application. Now, Firecracker go one step further and say, right, what we'll do is we won't just run a, a VM, we'll run a VM in a container. How many people knew that? Just a couple. Now, this is, this is special. So what they do is they would start that micro VM by saying it's not enough. We're also going to wrap it with a C group so we can limit the RAM and CPU it consumes, um, which is ideal. Platform like Fly IO they have this shared CPU resource, and maybe you could say, like, I'm going to give you a 2.5% of a core that way. You can also allocate a separate network namespace, just for a bit more belt and braces, and then it drops down into a non-root user. So normally VMs are run as root, so it can actually drop that as well. Um, so you get belt and braces. You can go very, very locked down. So in terms of users of this technology, um, you may have heard that AWS are using this in Lambda now, and also in their Fargate, Fargate serverless containers product. CAT containers is uh, an open source project that helps you run micro VMs a bit more like a, a container. You can actually go into Kubernetes and configure it to eventually run a micro VM instead of run C. So if that's of interest, have a look at that. Fly are trying to create a CDN for containers. So if you upload your image into their registry, they're using Firecracker to run it, not Docker. Even though you provide them a Docker image, they actually have their own system there. Koyeb is from Scaleway. Well, the ex-founders of Scaleway went off and built something, and they thought Kubernetes wasn't the right thing for them. And they might be right. 
Um, one thing that Lambda can do, sorry, Firecracker can do is a snapshot restore in about five milliseconds. Imagine that. It's very, very quick, even quicker than booting up. Um, AppFleet do edge hosting, and Liquid Metal have taken a slightly different approach. So they worked um, as a collaboration with WeWorks and Deutsche Telekom to virtualize Kubernetes nodes. So I was talking about the pod and the workload, but they're actually doing the whole node. So then within that node, those pods aren't isolated from each other, but they had a different problem to solve. And this is why at, Cube, at a KubeCon event, I'm trying to kind of show you that there's other things out there that might suit you better than Kubernetes itself for solving some of your problems. Astronomer, um, in early days, but they wanted to provide hosted Apache Airflow for customers, right? So this allows them to isolate it off. And again, it was better for them than giving them, the customers that through Kubernetes. Don't know if you know Ivan. He's got some really good container, low-level container work um, and blog posts. He recently created something that will probably remind you of Katacoda. Instead of using containers, you get a temporary lab with Ubuntu, K3S, anything you want to try out. And he's running them in um, Firecracker VMs as well. Now, as I said, like, there's a reason I know all of this stuff. And that's because I've been creating a product too called Actuated. And this is um, really trying to help people around GitHub Actions and CI. Frederick, um, I don't think he's here right now, um, is from Berlin, and he has an open source project called Parker. What he was trying to do was just build his code. That's it. Simple request. But he needs to build it on ARM and run the unit tests, the Go unit tests. Nothing special. It took 33 minutes on a hosted runner to do that. Whereas if he'd run it on his laptop, it was about a minute. So what I did is I just changed the runs on label and had that launch a Firecracker VM on a real ARM machine, and it was a 22x improvement. And this is something that we keep hearing. Ed also had the same problem. He's a distinguished engineer at Cisco and works on the network service mesh project. Now, separate to this diagram, there's another one I didn't include where his build took six hours and timed out on ARM because of the emulation and GitHub Actions was just too slow. Um, in that case, we got it down to nine minutes. But I wanted to show you this isn't just about ARM. And he said that on his powerful laptop, he could build this project in 20 minutes. On GitHub Actions, it was an hour and a half. It's, who submits pull requests here? Like, nobody. Nobody wants to put their hand up. A lot of us do. Would you, would you work on an open source project where you had to wait an hour and a half to get feedback? It would be painful, right? 20 minutes is a lot, but it, maybe it's viable, right? And that's what we're able to do here. Now, this is the basic idea, because this is a product. It's not an open source project. It just uses one. And it's a SaaS. The actuated control plane up there is something that we run. And as people commit, GitHub sends us webhooks. We then look at the webhook and decide what customer that is. We'll look at your fleet of machines. And just like the Kubernetes scheduler and the kubelet, we're going to score the machine for where we should place that VM, launch it, pass it a, a bootstrap token, and that's then used to GitHub, GitHub registers, and then we're out of the way. We don't do anything then, right? GitHub's runner will do the whole, the whole works, clean it up. And finally, the thing that's great about this is it's one shot. So all of the Kubernetes solutions tend to keep reusing the same container over and over again because it's slow in Kubernetes. This takes one second. You're in the machine. Jobs are good and... Now, as I say, Firecracker is running there, and ContainerD is being used to pull down the root file system for the VM image. It's quite tricky to get all of the right tools in a, in a container image to run a GitHub action. You can ask me how I know that, if you like, later. You know, you think you're there, and then you run your build, something fails, you add it, you run it again, it fails, um, and then you get a new customer, and it turns out they want headless Chrome, and there's 10 libraries missing. You know, and so actually building and maintaining the root file system is a job on its own. But ContainerD makes that very easy to pull down new versions. The copy and write file system means we're not flooding the disk. And so this is how we start to combine um, CNCF projects that are using Kubernetes with Firecracker to make something that looks similar. Yeah. And finally, CNI is a great way of just getting very easy 
easy button uh, networking for Firecracker. So I've got a demo for you, and one of the things I wanted to do is regression test um, custom resource, and see if it worked on different Kubernetes versions. Simply by uh, changing the runs on, this will be on an ARM machine, we're going to have, um, we'll have four or five versions of Kubernetes, and we'll just install K3S and apply the custom resource. So this is my GitHub repository. These are my versions. I actually have a few more that I've gone for. And normally, this is something that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do on hosted, because it's using ARM. I'm going to commit those. And then what I've got is two ARM machines here. On the top, we're doing a watch for the firecracker process. And the bottom, we've got an FS tail. And this is the VM that, that was it. Boots up that fast. You can't even start a container that quickly on Kubernetes. Now, we've got the two processes running on that machine. I've got another machine over there. We can see that's got two VMs on it as well. And in a moment or two, you'll see the system D output will load the K3S service. It's doing its job. Okay. And then we start to see all of the statuses complete, sort of 30 seconds odd. Now, I've built a little bit of management around this, again, because when you don't use Kubernetes, you find that you're actually missing a lot of the things Kubernetes does for you that are really handy, like visibility. So we have a dashboard for this as well. And then to add a little bit more value, um, insights about how your team has been using actions across the organization. There's one other thing that was really handy for us, though. Um, Ivan at Dax Swiss, he, he was having a hard time with GitHub Actions. And actually, before we even met him and brought him on as a customer, you've probably had this experience too. Red, 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 trying to get to green. Um, he really could have done with being able to debug his GitHub Actions. And so whilst we were here, we built something that effectively connects to a, an SSH gateway a managed one, and just allows you to get a SSH session into that. And it's been really handy. So when he wanted to run headless Chrome, I was able to get a shell in less than 30 seconds, go in there, um, install some packages, try it again, get what he needed, and, and solve the problem very quickly. It's also handy because I can do this on a hosted runner and then compare what GitHub is doing and kind of back reverse engineer it a little bit. So, so far we've run 20,000 VMs for paying customers, and this is very different from the kind of work you will have known me for, if you do know of me, for OpenFAS um, and things like that. Um, it's a paid product because we want to make a profit, we want to run a business that's sustainable, and that's around 60,000 webhooks over that time, because you get three messages, it's queued, it's in progress, it's finished. Yeah. Now, the ideal user profile for this probably wouldn't be a hobbyist. It probably wouldn't be a one-man band, really probably looking at a team of five to 50. And the kind of person that reaches out would be a DevOps, DevOps lead. Yeah. So if you want to know a bit about what we've learned, there's a blog post on actuated.dev that explains you know, even things like recent reliability with actions has been a bit of a thorn in our side as well. Um, but yeah, you can find out more there. So, you might be asking yourself, well, I've heard that GitHub has bigger runners. What about them? Um, Sergey used to work at Mirantis, actually, and he found that um, using Docker in Docker in a Kubernetes operator, so your own self-hosted software, um, was actually quite hard to, to maintain. And we have another customer like that too. One of the reasons is the version of Docker on the host can be different to in the container. Um, you have to make sure you've got the right permissions on it. It's a privileged container, or it's mounting a socket. Both are very bad things to be doing on company, company time. Um, but GitHub would bring out faster runners, actually. Um, and he found actuated was still quicker. So that's enough about what we're doing with it. Over to you. Um, there is a downside to all of this, is that you're going to need a machine with KVM available. The easiest way to look for this is dev slash KVM. 
And you may be thinking you need expensive bare metal. Bare metal can be quite cheap, actually. Hetzner have uh, 128 gigs of RAM, 16 cores, 32 threads, NVMe for about 100 pounds, 100 euros a month. It's nothing. You wouldn't even get an EC2 instance with half of that for that price. Um, you can also use nested virtualization. So DigitalOcean, Azure, um, there's one other cloud as well, Google Cloud. They all have nested virtualization on their VMs. So you can run this there, and it will be a little bit slower, but it will work. You do need a kernel, and you may find, as I did, that the pre-supplied kernel it doesn't have what you need in it. So if you want to run Docker inside of there, you're going to have to build your own one and customize it. Not too hard. Might take you a few weeks. Your init system could either be like systemd, if you want to run it like a server, or if you want a very fast boot and you just want to run a customer's workload, um, you can make your own simple init system for that instead. The root file system, I would suggest that you, you like we are very much aware of, is get a container image get a Docker file, build it out exactly how you want it, um, and that is the easiest way to work with Firecracker. The two options to boot it up, one is a config file, and the other is API calls. They're just HTTP curl statements to a socket. Um, it's very easy to play around with, and then decide what works best for you. For networking, there's a lab, if you look at the bottom here. You can also find this by Googling it and my name. Um, CNI is great. It just works. It's very easy to use, but you can just set up um, an IP address as well. Yeah. And then you'll have a VM, and you're in it. It's running on KVM, and you do what you like with it. But here's the important thing. You may be missing a lot of things if you go down this route. Um, Kubernetes is very feature-rich, and we've probably come to realize how much it actually does for us, even if you know, at times we complain about it. High availability, for one. Service discovery, auto-scaling, um, even just the capacity planning, these are all things that you will have to implement yourself if you want to use Firecracker like we're doing it. Okay. It's a very, very low-level tool. So I think one place it should be used is where containers don't work very well. So the CI, because of the security boundary, isn't really sufficient. Short-lived workloads, so this is basically what AWS say, that we built it for serverless workloads. But it has been stretched into managed hosting, as I mentioned earlier, Apache Airflow. Training and labs, we're seeing a lot of that kind of use case, so ephemeral environments. Um, if you do need GPU support, there's something very similar actually forked off Firecracker called Cloud Hypervisor, and this is more developed by um, the team at Cata Containers. Gvisor can also be an alternative for you if you don't need a full VM, but you do want to get uh, lock things down a bit more, and that will just replace itself into Kubernetes, um, and you may have already heard of it. So just a very quick overview of what we talked about. Legacy VMs, we're thinking VMware, or maybe something like VirtualBox. Isolation is great. The boot speed is slow, right? And there's reasons for that. There's a lot of devices we're emulating. The disk images are huge. We have to buy expensive VRO products or VMware Tanzu to be able to use it. Um, but the only requirement is CPU virtualization, right? Solely hypervisor, you're good to go. When it comes to cloud VMs, EC2, this kind of thing, again, similar boot speed, maybe 15 seconds to two minutes, depending on what cloud you're using, you have to build a spoke image. So you may need an AMI and a VHD and something else. With Firecracker and with containers, you can build an OCI image, and that works on every cloud, which I think makes this a lot easier if you're going to deploy onto multiple clouds. Tooling, again, like you could probably use the API of a cloud provider, a node autoscaler, or even Kubernetes itself to manage VMs, with Firecracker, you're basically completely on your own. Like you don't have an autoscaling group. You're going to have to do a lot of work if you're going to use it. But the only thing it actually needs is, is KVM to be available. Right? So the nested virtualization or bare metal. Okay. All right. So if you want to send me an email about this, you want to talk about Firecracker a bit more, that's my email address. The lab to try this out and just drop into a terminal with networking is at the bottom, 
And there's a talk I did quite a long time ago um, that a lot of people have come and spoke to me about. That's available on YouTube as well if you want a bit more information about this stuff. Okay. Thank you. There's five minutes if anybody has any questions here. I will also be at the back afterwards if you're too shy. But one at the back first. Great question, Alex. Uh, sorry, great presentation, Alex. Um, do you have a demo by chance that you can show us? Or am I putting you on the spot right now? <laughs> did, you, did you see the demo? Uh, no, I haven't. I might have missed it initially. Yeah. Yeah, so we did a demo of Actuated, and rather than showing you the Hello World, although you can go to this repo, and you'll see blow by blow um, a sample Docker file, a boot script, how to set up the networking. Um, these are the kind of curl, curl calls that you make if you set up Firecracker on your own. You know, setting the VM size, a root file system, where your kernel is, and then telling it to start. So yeah, that's what the, the quick start looks like. I thought it might be more interesting to show you what we built with it. So what we did is we ran a build on GitHub Actions. That scheduled a load of VMs. We saw them running on there, ran the jobs to completion. Yes, yeah. yeah, so another question at the front. Yeah. Uh, is it any harder to debug what's inside a Firecracker VM than, say, a container? Because there you would have um, NSenter, for example, with containers. Yeah, so how, how would you debug um, Firecracker process? One thing that we've been able to do here is simply, well, set up SSH, and then you're directly into the, the machine. Right, so simple solutions sometimes the best. Now, with a container, you don't usually do things like install SSH. Particularly for Firecracker, it's great. You know, to drop it in, start it, you're in, do what you need to do. Yeah. Um, alternatively, if you're running it on your own machine, you can attach to the process, standard in, standard out, and just type in. You actually, just sit there and log into it. Right. Anybody thinking they might want to have a play with this at some point? Got, got some ideas going? That's good. That's what I wanted to do with this talk. Yeah, Ralph. <laughs> Hi, Alex. That was great. Uh, I loved it. Um, one of the things I sort of wanted at the end was I'm thinking through your examples of pros and cons and so forth. And since you go from things like what happens in GitHub to things like what happens in Firecracker to con containers and so forth. Yes. At the end, I sort of want to like a, a generalized sense of when is the sweet spot for this? And it, it seems yeah. like super fast, lightweight things that happen in GitHub are really not the thing you have to worry about. It's really like the things that take a long time. Can we put the screen back on again? So um, I don't know if you saw this bit, but where a container doesn't work. So. Um, there are alternative things that we might think of, like WebAssembly, you know, you're really into that. But a VM is going to solve security problems where there are things that we perhaps shouldn't be running in Kubernetes, where the multi-tenancy isn't good enough, where GVisor, um, we still think that it might, we might be able to break through that. And you do want that hard tenancy. So hard tenancy is a definite one. Um, you, know, you can run those actions for six hours if you want. But people are running them for managed hosting. So Apache Airflow is something that Astronomer I.O. are trying to run as a managed service rather than using containers because they and their customers feel better about the way it's isolated. Just like maybe a Fargate container could run for like 12 months on AWS. Right, OK, uh, thank you. That's yeah. actually a, you know, a critical case that I hadn't really Sort of, I was sorting out, like, you've got number two, the short-lived workloads. And I'm, yeah. I keep thinking, OK, short-lived workload, if it's not you know, too much nested virtualization or something, GitHub is probably fine, except for a couple of examples that you showed where you know, it clearly isn't. But in clearly isn't, then the layout here makes a lot of sense. I'm like, it's an instant winner, right? So I'm not really thinking about the short-lived workloads, but the multi -tenant, hostile multi-tenancy is absolutely yeah. one of them, for sure. Thanks. No worries. Welcome. All right. Uh, we are out of time. So thank you very much.